And ladies and gentlemen, like Rabbi said, if we can please turn off or silence all electronic devices or cell phones. Thank you very much. I have learned that in times of separation and loss and sorrow, the Psalms can bring much comfort and solace. And in this spirit, I now recite from the 23rd Psalm, this great Psalm of faith. And these words remind us that even when we feel alone or lonely, we are never truly alone for God is with us. And we know that God is with Ruth and with Sydney, and they are together again. If you're familiar with these verses, you can join me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters, he restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I continue with a more modern day poem, which we do read at Temple Emmanuel from time to time, especially during the High Holy Days. I think Ruth would have been familiar with it. I think she may have liked it, otherwise, I think she would have told me, otherwise. <laughs> but I'll personalize it for her. At the rising of the sun and at its going down, we will remember Ruth. At the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we will remember her. At the opening, of the buds, and in the rebirth of spring, we will remember her. At the blueness of the skies, and in the warmth of summer, we will remember Grandma. At the rustling of the leaves, and in the beauty of autumn, we will remember her. At the beginning of the year, and when it ends, we will remember Ruth. For as long as we live, she too will live, for she is now a part of us as we remember her. When we are weary and in need of strength, when we are lost and sick at heart, when we have joy we crave to share, when we have decisions that are difficult to make, when we have achievements that are based on hers, we will remember Ruth. As long as we live, she too will live, for she is now a part of us as we remember her. We will remember Ruth, Grandma. She was memorable, unique, one of a kind, and one extraordinary person, and very much her own person. Therefore, our loss is sad and difficult and profound because she was the matriarch, dedicated to you, her dear family, and devoted to life and living. From camp counselor to den mother to Girl Scout leader, your mom was always there for you and for so many others. Ruth had a good mind. She had a mind of her own. She could be stubborn. That's your word, not mine. I'm 
Chloe Hugh. And we realize how much she taught us in terms of her giving, caring, and loving. Indeed, the greatest joy in life is to be able to say, I still have something to do. I want to accomplish yet more. And so she did. Ruth was still bowling on a bowling league at age 90. Uh, she never stopped going, doing, reaching, and hoping. So I believe that Ruth might say to all of us right now, thank you for being here because she was gracious. And then she might go on to say, don't mourn for me, for I did not lead a mournful life. And you know, in the balance, she certainly did not. She led a full, fulfilling, vital, purposeful, and good life. So today, we tell her good story and celebrate a life well lived. To begin with, Ruth was born and raised in Philadelphia in Strawberry Mansion. She was introduced to Sydney by Sydney's sister, Fran. Did I get that right? And it seemed like that was often um, two people met, one from Strawberry Mansion, one from South Philly. That seemed to be a pattern. Uh, he was from South Philly and would become the love of her life. They were married in 1945, and over their 62 years of marriage, they evolved into a real team, a true partnership, best friends, soulmates. When the kids moved out of the house, meaning you guys, <laughs> they purchased an RV, and they traveled everywhere. Already in her 50s, Ruth battled cancer, and she decided from that moment on to embrace life. And Ruth and Sydney truly embraced life. And they loved one another, and they loved to have fun together. When Sydney died on September 10, 2006, Part of Ruth died as well, but she did what she needed to do. She gathered her great inner strength, and she went on and lived as independently as possible, which was quite possible for her. It was about this time that she got Callie. I don't have to tell you who Callie is who is now 18 years old, and they became the best of buddies. Ruth was highly intelligent, served as a consumer rights advocate for Camden County. She also was a professional bowler and a bowling alley manager, and whatever mom or grandma did, which was a great deal. She did it completely and fully with a full heart and a lot of passion. Ruth had many interests. In addition to the traveling and the bowling, she made a great steak sandwich and was queen of bacon, right? Did I get that wrong? No. Queen of, <laughs> queen of what? What was she queen of? Bacon. Bacon? Bacon. Yeah, I thought you said that. <laughs> most of all, most of all, Ruth loved you, her family. She would do anything and everything for you, and you for her. And how she loved you, Neil, and Alice, and Linda, and Melissa, Karen and Michael, Morgan and Brett, and Carson. 
and great-grandchildren, Jack and Sarah. I know Ruth was so proud of all of you. I mean, she was proud of your accomplishments and prouder yet of the bright, sensitive, and caring family that you are. Ruth is also survived by and will be profoundly missed by her sister Esther and her brother Jerry and your wife Ruth, with whom she was extremely close, actually inseparable. All of us here today, whether you're here in person or here virtually, will carry with us so many warm, rich, and good memories of this dynamic woman. And all of our sacred stories and precious memories can never ever be taken away. Ruth and Sydney will live on in you and through you. Ruth died, but she died knowing that she helped to raise and guide and teach and inspire children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, who in turn have so much to offer to others. You are her and their precious legacy. May Ruth's memory make life all the more precious to us. May her memory inspire us to labor for a world in which every life shall find its fulfillment as she found hers. For as long as we live, she too will live, for she is now a part of us as we remember her. And to keep those memories going, I'm first going to call on you, Neil. I'm just going to take my mask off so people can hear more clearly. So I, I, I want to start out with this photograph that I think most of you have seen before. Um, it's a photograph of uh, mom and dad. They were married on February 12, 1945. I'm not sure if this was taken at that time or a day or two after. They were in uh, Sioux City, Iowa, where Dad was stationed before he was to, to go and fight in World War II in Europe. And I show this for two reasons. One is that Mom and Dad adored each other. It was actually the beginning of my story, because they got married in February. Uh, Dad left immediately afterwards, and I was born nine months later. So I might have been, <laughs> I might have been in this picture, too. I'm not sure. Um, but, but uh, this was this was the start. Um, so uh, I'd just like to share some memories of Mom's life. Uh, but first, I want to just say thank you to Rabbi David and thank you to all the families here and all the family and friends who are attending virtually. Um, you know, Mom's memory. So, um, just to say that at the beginning of Mom's career, she was trained as a commercial artist, but the first few years, or the first year or two of her life, she was a single mom because my dad was away um, fighting the war. And it's my understanding from, from pictures that uh, she and Hester and Francis and some of, some of the other people sort of set up their own nuclear family of, of moms who were taking care of kids um, when the dads were gone. So that was the beginning. And I don't think she ever got to practice as a, an artist the way she was trained, but she certainly did do a lot of art around the house. She painted things, she embroidered things, she um, made dolls and other things. So the house was always full of her own art, uh, which 
but it was, it was very nice. So my childhood memories, but I, I was raised uh, as a kid, I remember in the, the 50s and early 60s. And um, some of the things, that, that we, we lived first in a row house on Kimberly Street in, um, in Philadelphia, in the Northeast area, and then moved to uh, Simmons, New Jersey, which was like the suburbs back then, was a, a farm area, now it's all built up, but when we first came there, there were horses and cows and apple trees and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, some of my um, early memories, one is that mom was a counselor at Play Mount Day Camp, uh, which was where we went every summer, Linda and I, and I don't remember much about the day camp, but I, I see pictures of mom wearing a Play Mount uh, Day Camp shirt and really short shorts, and, um, and I'm quite yeah. surprised that short shorts were in fashion back then, but there she was. Um, I, I remember as a kid some debates over music. So mom liked Benny Goodman. And I, I wanted to play Miles Davis, and so so sometimes we, we had to compromise to figure out you know, what what would we watch, what would we listen to this morning. Um, I remember the bowling alley. So mom would go bowl. You know, she'd like to encourage me to be a bowler. I was not too interested, but there were pool tables there, and so I would go with her to the bowling alley. And my friends and I would shoot pool while she was teaching other people to bowl. Uh, so, so the the one disappointment she might have had is, you know, is, is that neither Linda nor I ever became very good bowlers. And maybe Carson's better. I don't know. Um, as Robert David said, um, a remarkable thing about Mom is that you know, bowling was her passion. She continued it until age ninety, even when her doctors um, kept on warning her, "Your spine is getting bent, and that bowling ball is." is bending your spine, you should stop bowling. But part of the stubborn streak of her and, and the many of, of her sibs and the rest of the family, she wanted to keep on bowling. So she kept on bowling when her spine was getting bender and bender. And she loved it. So that, that, that was the way she led her life. Um, family was a huge part of our, of our growing up. Like every weekend, we'd either go to the Shinefield house in Blackwood, of Benno's house in, in, in Philadelphia, and meet all the cousins and aunts and uncles and have dinner together. And so this was like every weekend of, of, of our growing up was something with part of the family. Um, and family was really, I think, the, the strongest driving force in our life. As you know, um, you know, at the end of our life, um, my brother, Jerry, and his wife, Ruth, you know, and sister, Esther, would come and visit mom when she couldn't get around anymore. She was basically um, wheelchair bound and couldn't, couldn't leave the house very much. But every week they came to visit her and, and they shared even together. And so the, the family and family ties were just uh, amazingly strong and persistent. And you know, that, that was just a major part of our life. Um, something about politics in her. So the first stories I remember about politics, she was a super fan of Franklin Roosevelt. As you might imagine, she thought that Franklin Roosevelt really changed the trajectory of America and the lives of Americans in ways that, that we couldn't understand. But she just really adored Franklin Roosevelt. And after that, she was a devoted Democrat. Um, she campaigned for Democratic governors in New Jersey. Uh, she served on Democratic uh, uh, committees. She was a poll worker. Um, and to the very end, uh, even when her memory was not very strong anymore, when I called her, she would ask me if I had heard what Rachel Maddow said that night. And sometimes with you know, some, some outrage as to what, what bad things Rachel Maddow had, had described the other side was doing. And when she met um, Carson's partner, Kelly, she was overjoyed that someone um, was joining a, a group who was a political activist um, with a social conscience bent. And that just fit right in with, with her values in life. So that, that, that was really nice for her. Um, she has a random memory about food preferences. Um, I, I don't know where it came from, but as an adult, every single time mom and I went out for dinner, she ordered either shrimp or lobster. There was nothing else she would ever eat growing up. 
at home, she was fond of uh, chocolate peppermint patties. And I remember that because I still have some now. Every time I came, she would stuff my travel bag full of peppermint patties. And I still have some I'm just carrying around today. Yeah, I've had a couple this week already. Um, so mom's granddaughter, Morgan, who couldn't be here, she lives in Dandel, Pennsylvania, but they have had a huge ice storm and they closed Butler University where she teaches. She couldn't travel here, but she wanted me to relay a couple of, of her strongest memories. So one was that of mom and dad as being adventurers. So when Morgan was still a kid, I'm, I'm maybe 10, 12 years old, I don't remember the age, um, mom and dad started on RV adventures and they went around the country in national parks and, and, and other beautiful places. And then they came to, to, to visit us in California, um, including one other places. Uh, we met them at the Windsor Water Slide Park, um, where um, Carson and Morgan and, and I, and maybe Alice, went on the slides. I'm not sure if Mom went on the slide. She might have, but if anything, she was a cheerleader for that. But Morgan was just impressed that old people, and by that time, Mom and Dad, they were 50, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that old people would be traveling around in RV adventures, you know, adventuring across the country. So she, she thought that was really cool. Um, the other thing that she admired about mom was her um, word puzzle. Word puzzle. So um, mom was an obsessive word puzzle solver, solver. So she got two newspapers a day for her entire adult life, mostly for the puzzles. So she would do the anagrams and crossword puzzles. She was really good at that. And, and Morgan has now become a puzzle fan herself, but told me that she could never match her mom, even in mom's later years. So um, I'll just end getting back to, to family. So you know, mom's touchstones were, were always the, the, the family. I, every time I spoke on the phone, and this might be true for many mothers, and she says, first thing she says, how's the family? How's Morgan? How's Carson? How's Melissa? How's Alice? Um, every time. When's the family going to come and visit me next? Um, but you know, her, her life was really family devoted. With friends as well. So um, a very close friend of hers, a neighbor, um, Mark and Jan Schatz. Um, um, she was the, the godmother to their children um, because she always seemed to be sort of a family person. You know, and, and there was orientation. So to just end my, my comments, I, I would just say, Mom, um, we, we love you. We're going to miss you. Um, you have a great life. And um, thank you. And Linda, do you have words? from your heart that you want to speak as well, right? I do. Okay. Neil talked about mom and and everything she did and didn't do. I'm going to talk about when she was speaking. I did not speak at my father's service. It is important that I speak now. As mom's death closes this generation of our family tree. Mom and I were able to spend quality time together over the last several years. It means a lot to me that I have these memories and closure. We shared confidences, laughter, and often talked of the values we hope to pass to our, ch to our children and grandchildren. We hoped we had taught them well. Through teamwork with my brother Neil, he and I were able to meet all of mom's needs, wants, and small pleasures. 
She asked very little of us, and we were happy to ease her burden. Her last years passed quietly, almost always with family. Neil and I, mom's grandchildren, and her sister, brother, and sister-in-law surrounded her declining years. We will remember her as a person rich in kindness and understanding throughout. Her family, and especially I, am grateful. It was by example that she led the Benowitz family. She gave us confidence in ourselves to meet every challenge. She was strong and brave and chose how to live the life she was given. I will miss her. Karen's going to speak next. So I, I made a top 10 list of things that Ruth believed in. Believed. You've heard bits and pieces of them from the rabbi and from Neil and, and from my mother. Um, Carson's the only one who has it hard because he's the last one to speak to come up with all original information. So, she believed in baseball. Regardless of what she was doing, she'd watch or listen to the Phillies games. She knew about each of the players and she shared her favorites and who she thought should be treated immediately because they were an idiot. <laughs> she believed in collecting treasures. Siamese cat figurines, sculpture, Asian-inspired art, crystal, plants, African violet, violets were her favorites, and music, um, vinyl, 8-track, cassette, CD, from Big Band to John Denver. She believed in democracy. Um, at one point, and Neil talked a little bit about this, um, she walked door to door to campaign for township committee, and she won. Um, she worked the polls for many years, and even after she wasn't able to walk, she wheeled herself in to do so. She believed in travel and adventure. She wanted to see the world, and making the pilgrimage to Israel was the trip of a lifetime for her instead. And of course the stories of the RV and wandering the nation, seeking adventure. Uh, she always came to visit, they always came to visit when they worked summers at the beach and she would come to the crab restaurant where I worked and eat all the seafood and make friends with my friends and enjoy the ocean with us. And I always heard, oh, your grandma's so cool. Yeah, it's true. Um, leading into, she believed in being hip and fashionable. From the two-tone shaded aviator sunglasses, her attention getting non-conforming wardrobe, think cowboy boots and prairie skirts for any occasion. She always stayed up on the latest technology. She was the first one I knew who owned a computer in their home. And she bought me my first computer. And most people in, in my generation don't have grandmothers on Facebook, but she's on the cutting edge of that as well. She believed in bowling, of course. You've heard a lot about that. And if you're good at something and you enjoy it, why not? Um, she enjoyed the athleticism, the social aspects, and the fact that she was recruited by teams regularly because of how many times she scored 300 perfect game, and she had all her 300 pins to mark the occasions. She believed in furry friends. She always had cats and dogs, from her German Shepherds to Little Pixie. 
and lots of felines, and always supporting her local animal shelter. And um, if you want to ask later, I can tell you the story of the time that her German Shepherd puppy, Tara, ate the entire neighborhood's Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> <laughs> she believed in self-expression. Um, we had a great talk one time about school uniforms and how what an abomination that was because kids should be able to express themselves. And the way they do that is in their clothing. And um, tells us a lot about her. Um, she also expressed herself in many ways. Paint, needle and thread, calligraphy, crafty anything. A couple of things the cousins were talking about this week were the, the beaded curtain by the front door of the house when you first walked in, and kind of setting the tone for the groovy lounge in the living room, the blue fuzzy chair that we all loved to pile in. Um, and Morgan remembered the, the doll made out of a detergent bottle that lived in the bathroom. She was a Renaissance woman. Growing up, every time I visited, I feel like I learned something new about something she did that I didn't know in addition to all the things that were already mentioned. Um, and her first job was at the Philadelphia Free Library. And um, she continued to volunteer at her local library until well into her 90s. Um, camp counselor, teaching assistant, artist, career planning facilitator, politician, all kinds of things. Most of all, she believed in love and family. She couldn't remember a lot of things at the end, but she always remembered to ask about everyone individually, one at a time, and make sure she knew what they were doing. Somehow she remember, remembered everybody's birthdays, and she wanted to know if she had remembered to send something. If she didn't, she wanted to get on that right away. The love that I hold and I will carry with me is warm, unconditional, always full of the love of life, lifelong learning, and the spice she was a spicy woman. A force of nature. That was my grandmother. And Carson. Yeah, 
that street, uh, that's, a, that's where my favorite diner is. And the next street, there's a park, it's very good memories of that park. Sorry, not a street, that next off ramp. Another off ramp, right, this is somewhere she, she would go with Sid. Uh, and then see this one, this one leads to the secret way to get to the stadium. There's a secret way to get to the stadium. I, maybe this is well known to all of you. It was news to me. I have never found it again since. It is just the secret way. It's grandma's secret way to get to the stadium. Uh, we took it, sure enough, ended up on back roads uh, behind a, a, a battered El Camino going about uh, 12 miles an hour. Uh, she spent the entire 10 minutes we were stuck down in South Camino, letting South Camino know exactly what she thought of it. But we got there, plenty of time, arrived, parked, went in, she uh, marched me straight to the, uh, the stadium store, got me a, a, a Phillies hat, not the blue one, she did like the dark red one better. Um, she did not like the, like the bright red one, the dark red is very, there was a hat, there was a Phillies hat that I was to have, and I did in fact get it. Um, and then she let me in on one uh, last secret, which was Jimmy Rollins. Uh, Jimmy Rollins would have been the shortstop for the Phillies at that time. Uh, but she said, I call him j -Roll. He's fantastic. He's a great fielder. He can hit. I've heard he's very smart. He's very active in the community. He also has a great butt. Great what now? <laughs> hey. Uh, so we, we get to our section. Um, and I was like, OK, well, let's go, Grandma. Start down the steps. Turn around. She is just, she has just left me behind. She's still at the top. She's talking to the usher. They're exchanging stories about the teams from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, he's telling her something about Richie Ashford. She's saying that is absolutely not true. I'm telling her the actual fact about Richie Ashford. This goes on for about 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm sure people were just sneaking past that usher into in the, like he was paid. He was absolutely enraptured in, in grandma. Um, I don't actually remember how this game turned out. This was 2008, so it was reasonable to expect that the Phillies would have won. Um, and uh, by the end, that usher showed up, presented Grandma with a signed a baseball signed by Charlie Manuel, uh, that she I believe she still has. And uh, yeah, I just remember that day so much because there was just this sense of being in her world being in her town, right? Being in her city, in her state, states, I guess it was uh, her, her, uh, by her river, right? Uh, knowing that she had kind of touched and identified and, and, and taken into herself and wanted to share with that with everyone else, every, every bird or tree, piece of concrete, every building, every place you could get, uh, every kind of food, I, well, some kinds of food. Um, and she, she was just, Fearless, she was outgoing. She could make. She made a friend in an instant. Just turned around, looked at that guy, and said, "I am going to be. You are going to be my friend now." And sure enough, <laughs> next thing you know, she was getting free baseballs. Uh, she had that ability to touch and claim the world around her, and she will be deeply missed. And even in her absence, all of those things she's touched, all of those things that she's claimed, they will remain hers. So, love you. Those were such amazing tributes. And I know she is proud of all of you. We do conclude our service here with a traditional prayer called the Eir Mole Rachamim. I always look at a Hebrew name or Yiddish name because I think one fulfills their name. So she is Rochel, which is like Rachel, Rachel, Rochel. And Rachel of the four matriarchs was the most beloved. Um, Mother Rachel. If you go to Israel, she was in Israel. Um, you see the tributes. Not so much to Sarah, not so much to Rebecca, not so much to Leah. It's all about we're the children of Rachel. And she's the daughter of David, a name which I happen to like too. But uh, David means beloved. So for both her Rocco and David, it's all about love. So let us rise now.
Elmole Rachamim, Shochein Baum Romim, Hamitse Menucha Nakona Tachat Kanfe, Hash Hina Lenishmat Rochobat David, Shakalacha Le Oloma, Baal Harachamim Yitzror Bitzor Hakaimet Nishmata, Adonai Hu Nakalata, the Tanua, the Shalom Al Mishkala, the Namar, Amen. O God, full of compassion, thou who dwellest on high, grant perfect rest unto the soul of our beloved Ruth, Rocho, who has departed from this world. Lord of mercy, bring her into your presence and let her soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. Be thou her possession, and may she rest in peace, and may they rest in peace together, and we say, Amen. Oh, you may be seated. Thank you for your hands on the lid. 